stand this morning as we sing this together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, for He is worthy to be praised. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Calvary. Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. So glad that you're here. Now, I have to admit to you right away that I am not supposed to be leading worship this morning. Pastor Julia, many of you are coming to hear Pastor Julia's lovely angelic voice. And today you have this old rusty crow here today. Amen. Thank you, brother. He always says amen when I say that. He always shouts me through. This morning, baby Lauren is not feeling well and woke up very, very sick. And so mama's home with baby. And I found out I had to lead worship just before we got to practice. And so I'm going to do my best. But here's the, here's the deal I had to make with you. I'll do my best and you do your best. And I believe that God will do the rest. Amen. We're going to sing this Amen. chorus a couple more times through. Yes, Lydia. You cannot have a snack. Just wait, okay? Thank you. <laughs> That's my daughter, by the way. That's not just a random child. She'll get a snack in a few moments. But we're going to sing this chorus again. Will you just turn around, maybe the person beside you or behind you? You know what? If we would only be as bold with our Heavenly Father like that little girl was this morning, don't care who's around, what's happening. I need something this Amen. morning. And maybe that might be a word in the sermon just for you. We're going to sing this chorus a few more times through. Would you cross the aisle, turn around, greet someone, give them a hug. Maybe give him a holy kiss as we worship this morning. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, for he is worthy.
And well, this morning is Palm Sunday, the day in which we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem, not as a weak person, but as a conquering king, coming in as the crowd shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Hosanna means our God saves. And this morning, what we're going to do, and we mentioned this, made a special announcement this week. I'm going to invite all the kids this morning. Hopefully you brought some instruments with you. If you didn't bring your instruments, we've done this every year now for a couple years. We are going to have a Palm Sunday parade. And we're going to do what they did when Jesus came in riding on that donkey. And so come on up to the front, all the kids. Levi's so excited. All right, we have kids here today. I know we do. Where are they? Come on up. Come on, big sis. You can bring little sis. Come on up. Yeah. All right. We got guitars and tambourines. Now, we got a few more instruments if you need a few more instruments up here. She's ready. So what we're going to do, Levi is going to lead the group, and they're going to go, Levi, are you listening? Down this aisle, back, down this aisle. We'll do this three or four times, okay, as we do the song, okay? Now, don't run. Don't walk too fast. This is a parade as we're celebrating Hosanna, Jesus. And we're going to sing this song, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. And so Pastor and Mrs. Hines Maybe if you wanted one person to be on the front, on the back, kind of keep the, keep the line going, that would be good. Yeah, sure. And uh, are you guys ready? Make it, let me hear your instruments. Can you, can you move your instruments or make your... Oh, yeah. Leave, I got the harmonica. Exactly. I heard that this morning as we got ready for church. It's amazing that both Levi and the harmonica made it to the church this morning after the, the morning we had. Okay, let's go down the lower level. Let's go on the lower level. Everyone, let's walk down the stage, Levi. Walk down the stage. Let's walk down the stage now, and we'll get ready to go for the parade. Are you ready? No? No? All right. Mrs. Hines, maybe they have to grab your hand, and we'll start this parade. Levi was pretty bold about it, but we'll see. Okay. As we start the music, let's parade around and celebrate that Jesus is king. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. All right, let's go, Daniel, and everybody else. Turn to you. All right, make lots of noise. Good job. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning.
Can everyone give a good instrument sound on their instruments? Yeah. Woo. Wonderful job. Didn't the kids do a great job this morning leading us in that parade? All right. You can take that instrument back to your seat. You can take it back to your seat. And if you want to play along with the rest of it, all right. Wonderful. We're going to continue in worship and you may be seated for these next few songs if you want to. Thank you very much. What a great parade. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, this morning on Palm Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus is King. And this next song says, Sing to the King who is coming to reign. I'll sing it this morning. And glory to Jesus. The lamb that was slain, life and salvation, his empire shall bring, joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, song declaring. Let us 
sing a song, song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the Well, we know that the kingship of Jesus is not just past and it's not just present, but it's also future. The scripture says that his kingdom shall reign forevermore. Amen. And one day he is going to bring in that kingdom. Our faith is going to be sight. And we believe the kingdom of God is already here, but it's not fully here yet. There's still more things that God desires to do. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus comes again. And we get to crown him Lord of all. And he's fully known, not just simply as Jesus as a song or Jesus as a person, but he's known as Jesus the King. And this, this little chorus and this song says, There's a blessed time that's coming, coming soon. It may be evening, morning, or at noon. You know it? Come on. The wedding. King when he comes. Oh, we shall see the King when he We shall see the King. We shall see the King when he comes. He's coming in power. We'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the King. Are you ready should the Savior call today? Oh, would Jesus say, well done or go away? Oh, my home is for the pure, the vine can never stay. We shall see the King when He comes. Oh, and we shall see the King. We shall see the King, we shall see the King when He comes. He is coming in power, we'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the King when He comes. Oh, my brother, are you ready for the call? The King when He comes. Oh yeah. Oh, and we shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in power. We'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the King when He comes. Blessed time that's coming, coming soon. Oh, it may be evening, morning, or at noon. Oh, the wedding of the bride united with the groom. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. Oh, and we shall see the King. We shall see the King, we shall see the King when He comes. Oh, He is coming in power, we'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in power, we'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the King 
overcome, I lift my voice to the King in need of nothing. Empty hand and I
say thank you Lord or something that you just know you need to say to the Lord today Father we love you oh God thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people today hallelujah praise your name be exalted oh Lord our God Hosanna Amen. You may be seated. Isn't God good? Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Well, thank you this morning for coming and joining us in worship. At this time, we're going to dismiss the children to their children's program. And so uh, I believe there's Michelle and Jennifer and some other. All the kids will make their way out to the kids program. Just a couple of quick announcements this morning before we go to the Word today. Um, first of all, a reminder that this Friday is Good Friday. And we are having a special service here at this church, a combined service. And so the assemblies in George's Brook, in Northwest Brook, the New Life Christian Center Assembly, and our church will be all joining together for one large Good Friday service. And so that is going to require us to make some changes. There'll be a few more seats in the sanctuary. And you folks have agreed, and I'm so happy that you've agreed, that you are going to sit all in the front half of the church next on Friday. I'm so glad I got that email from the congregation. Pastor, we would love to make sure that our visitors have room in the back. And so uh, next, this is this Friday, okay? Service is 1030. Pastor Hayward Primer. How many people remember Hayward Primer? I feel sorry for you. Okay. <laughs> Hayward Primer was the pastor here when I first came here and a former minister here. And he's joining us. Him and Mrs. Primer will be joining us for that service. We're looking forward to that. We try to do, uh, find a guest speaker for the Good Friday service. And so he'll be joining us for Good Friday. And uh, we are, of course, expecting a larger crowd. And so I'm looking for a couple extra people to help with the ushering on that Good Friday service and a couple people who will be willing to park cars. Now, if you like telling people what to do, this is the job for you. And uh, so if you would, wouldn't mind, we will save you a seat, make sure you have a seat inside. But of course, we we're gonna have quite a few more vehicles and last year we had great parking attendance and this year we need great ones again. And so uh, please, if you're able to help me, let me know following the service if you can be a parking attendant we give you a vest, and we can give you a stick to make you seem real official. And, but we need some help just parking vehicles to make sure everyone gets in safely. Let me say this to you. If you are not a parking attendant, 
and you drive up and the parking attendant says, excuse me, I need you to pull up over here. This is where you're going to park. You have to listen to the parking attendant, okay? They are the deputies next Friday. And so uh, I know last year we had some people that said, I don't care what the parking attendant, I'm going to park wherever I want. And we had some issues. And so, uh, Edwin, can you raise your hand, Edwin? St stand up for a second, Edwin. Edwin's in front of our parking attendants. He will come after you. <laughs> That's a guarantee, he said. If you do not listen to him, he will come after you. Edwin is my bodyguard, parking attendant, anything I need. And so, and, uh, so Edwin, thank you very much for helping with that. We need a few more volunteers out with the parking, and we'll try our best to get everyone in safely and out safely as well. All your other announcements are in the bulletin. Of course, Good Friday service, 1030. Communion will be served. You folks have graciously said you're going to sit in the first front half of the congregation. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we're on good, of course, Easter Sunday. All the other announcements are in your bulletin. If I forgot something, best to call Pastor Julia because I don't know anything anyway. All right. At this time, we're going to invite Louie to come, and he's going to read the scripture for us today. We're looking in your Bibles, if you have it with you, at 1 Samuel chapter 8 looking at the first eight verses of 1 Samuel chapter 8. Reading uh, from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, 1 to 9, uh, from the NIV, because I lost my paper that Pastor Andrew gave <laughs> me. So you should follow along. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. How amazing, his sons didn't walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they, not, for they, not, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I have brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. The word of the Lord. Am I working here now? No. Yes, no, maybe so. Not working. Okay. I'll use the handheld. Testing. Testing one, two. All right. Thank you very much for reading that scripture. We're going to look at that this morning. Of course, as I said, Palm Sunday is the Sunday in which we celebrate and remember Jesus riding into Jerusalem as king. This, of course, begins something called Holy Week. And if you were at the Manna Cafe this week, you would have seen a short video about the influence and importance of Holy Week and what it all means. But it starts today. And every day leading up to the cross. And next Sunday, Lord willing, you'll be joining us for what we call Resurrection Sunday. Where we celebrate the fact that Jesus is not dead but surely is alive. And we'll continue in the tradition on Resurrection Sunday of women preaching the resurrection. Pastor Julia will be here next Sunday to preach her message. Before I do that, though, I do want to just give a quick update on my trip that I went on. Many of you are asking about that. I had a wonderful trip. I wasn't here last Sunday. I was actually at last Sunday in Tennessee. And so I want to say good morning, y'all. The church was very gracious to provide me an opportunity to go to the SPS conference, Society for Pentecostal Studies. This was an academic conference, and this is where academics and Pentecostal scholars from all over the world gathered together. We found ourselves in Atlanta, Georgia, 
And uh, any, anyone been to Atlanta before? Raise your hand. Anyone been to the airport in Atlanta? That is massive. It's huge. I'm so glad I was by myself. I can't imagine bringing the three kids to that airport along with my wife. Um, and so uh, Chandler School of Theology, that's such a few pictures I took while we are there. You know, when you folks were suffering in the snow, that's what I had to suffer through when I was in Atlanta and met so many wonderful people, reconnected. This is a table of people here. Of course, table of people. You see that already. But this is from the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And at, sitting at that table is Dr. David Wells. He's the general superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Uh, Dr. Wells actually preached at my ordination service. And so he remembered me. He actually remembered me as Julia's husband. He remembered Julia better. There were several people at that conference and said, oh, you're Julia's husband. And I thought she would be so proud to hear that. Dr. Van Johnson. Anyone remember Dr. Van Johnson? He used to come to camp, uh, teenage camp, and, and he was uh, a seminary. I remember Van Johnson at the church in Toronto I went to. He used to lead worship. He used to get into the worship, and he'd say, one more time, one more time. We sing that song about eight times. One more time. And so when I do that here, that's where I get it from, one more time. And, of course, many others. We've got a young man sitting next to me. I'm sitting right over here. A young man sitting next to me. He is a pastor in Vancouver Island, Thriving Church. Dr. Aaron Ross, Dr. Um, uh, Caleb Courtney, Dr. Marty Middlestrap, many, many people that we got to connect with and uh, reconnect with, and it was wonderful to be with them. I was the most, probably the most uneducated person at the conference. And um, I told someone yesterday, you know that saying, it's better to be perceived a fool than open your mouth and prove it? Well, that was me. I kept my mouth shut as long as I could <laughs> until I knew that I knew the answer. And then I would say, what about this? And I know the answer to that. And then, so I was in Atlanta, Georgia, from, uh, got in there late Wednesday night, drove on the biggest highway I've ever been on in my life. Oh, man, talk about praying and you drive. And uh, a lot of hand gestures in Atlanta at nighttime when you're driving there. Not new to me. Uh, then, uh, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, left Saturday evening, met with a classmate on the way as I drove up to Cleveland, Tennessee. And this is my school that I am attending online. Um, unfortunately, I can't be there in person. This is my first chance to be there in Cleveland, Tennessee, the Pentecostal Theological Seminary. And it's on a large compound and a beautiful campus. Lee University is there. It's just, it's hard to describe. But let me say this, you know, on the calendar, it says it's spring, but it feels, still feels like winter, right? It's spring there, okay? So just know spring is somewhere, just not here. It's there. While I was there, I got the take in on Sunday morning. I mean, you should be real impressed with your pastor. I went to an 8.30 Sunday morning service. 8.30. I never had to get up early. I had no kids waking me up at nighttime. I could have slept in as long as I want. I was on vacation, so to speak. 8.30, find myself at the North Cleveland Church of God. You can see the big compound there. The 8.30 services in the smaller chapel. The smaller chapel is probably twice as big as our, our church here today. And I met with the pastor, Dr. Mark Williams. He is the former general superintendent of the uh, Church of God denomination. It's a very large Pentecostal denomination. Very nice man. And got to meet with him and have a picture. And uh, he made me stand up in front of everyone and introduced me. And I, I thought he thinks I'm like someone important back home. But I took it all in, waved at everybody. Hi, you know. <laughs> Greetings on behalf of the true Pentecostal church in the world and that kind of stuff. And so met with him on Sunday. And then after that... Went home, changed out of my church clothes, put on some jeans and a nice shirt, and went to a different church and had a great time at the other church. So I was churched out. But you know what's great about going to churches on vacation? You got a sermon when you come home. Amen. <laughs> Another quick picture I'll show you quickly. Hopefully this will. Here I am Monday morning. Monday morning I was spending time at the seminary. And here I am in the large chapel. They redid a major renovation to the chapel of the seminary and made it more like a studio, and now they broadcast a show every week out of there, and they do presentations from all over the world, and so one of the professors said, stand up behind there and get your picture taken. It's, it was absolutely amazing. And then this last set of pictures, I believe this is the last set here. Uh, this picture of me and this individual on the left, this is Dr. Michael Baker. He is the president of the seminary. And this gentleman here, uh, Dr. Baker, he met with me for over two hours, sat down, talked with me, and personally gave me a guided tour over all the campus, every classroom, every, introduced me. He said, this is Andrew Ball from Newfoundland. Well, he didn't say, he said Newfoundland. 
And I would say, no, it's Newfoundland. And, uh, and he was showing me, made me greet everybody. He made me feel like a million bucks. It made me feel so good. And uh, it was so nice that I could, was able to give him a gift of a Newfoundland chocolate chocolate bar uh, from, with Newfoundland blueberries. And he looked at me and he said very seriously, he said, Andrew, there is no greater gift you could give me than chocolate. And so I'm going to pass all my, all my classes, all my grades. And then on the right-hand side here, this is another picture of one of my professors, Dr. Tom Berlin. And he gave me one of his books. And I only went down with a carry-on. I didn't want to pay. I think it's kind of crazy you got to pay for stuff to get on the flight. And so I'm cheap, and uh, I didn't want to pay, so I did everything with a carry-on. And, of course, when I left, I was told by two individuals in my house, I won't tell you who the two are, you better bring gifts back to us. And so I had to make sure there was space there. Every professor I met, they were giving me this book. And have you got this book? Have you got that book? And, and one professor said, have you got this book? And I said, yes, sir, I have. And have you got this book? Yes, sir, I have. You got all my books? I said, yes, because you made me buy them all in your class. <laughs> I said, that's why you're driving such a nice car. But all these professors, so I came back. I was going on the way home. I was going through the Toronto airport like this. My book bag was so heavy with books and all the gifts. But I had a wonderful time. And Dr. Baker wanted me to extend uh, greetings to you as a church family. And uh, thank you for uh, giving your pastor an opportunity to continue his education and grow. And it was a phenomenal trip. And I've made lots of connections. And I felt like I was from the Ministry of Tourism. Because every person I talked to has said, you've got to come to Newfoundland. You've got to come to Newfoundland. And so we'll see maybe in the coming months, coming years, we'll have some of these individuals in our church looking forward to it. And uh, as long as we can get them here, they said they would preach for us. And so that would be wonderful. So I had a wonderful trip, so thank you very much. And I have many more pictures on Facebook if you want to see them. So thank you once again. This morning, for a few moments, I know it won't be too long because... I know the Sunday school teachers they don't like it when I preach. You like it when I preach long, but they don't like it when I preach long. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled, Give Us a King. Give Us a King. And this comes from the text that Louis read this morning. You see, everyone needs or has a sort of king in their life. For some people, this is the king in their life right now. King Charles, right? King Charles III. For other people, this is the king in their life. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for other people, this is the king in their life. I'm in that number. King size bar. That is the king in my life. Well, all of us, to some degree, have a king. You know, we desire leadership. That's kind of a funny way of looking at it, but it's true. We desire leadership. People that are, there's no leadership, when there's no direction, when there is no overseeing of something, we say, well, what is happening here? You know, if you went into a room full of kids running around wild and screaming, if you came to kids' night and they're running around wild and screaming, you'd say, who's in charge here? Or, or if you're at a business or a restaurant somewhere and there's a problem, at you, you say, can I speak with your manager? I need to speak to somebody. Or, or maybe if you're watching a hockey game and you notice on the ice that there are some players or some individuals on the ice with black and white stripes, and it reminds you that there are people there that have authority. There are people there that give leadership. Whether you agree with it or not, they're there, referees, to give leadership. We see in our text that Louis read this morning that the elders of Israel went to Samuel when Samuel was old. Samuel was an old man. His time had passed. He's getting ready to, to relax now. And he said, give us a king. They wanted leadership. You see, people need leadership. And whether you realize it or not, you will find something or someone to lead you. You will. Something or someone will call the shots in your life and lead you. And I want to remind you that leadership is always leading you somewhere. And so you need to be mindful. You need to be cognitive of the fact that leadership is leading you somewhere. I'm struck by the fact that the people of Israel, the elders who came to Samuel, they said this. They said, give us a king to judge us. Now, we think of a king to represent us, a king to look to, but they wanted a king to judge them. 
This word judge, what does it mean? Well, it means in the Hebrew a couple things. It means to act as a lawgiver, to rule and govern with authority, to decide and divide, and to enter into a controversy. You know, to insert oneself into a situation to bring about a change. The Hebrews wanted someone in their lives that would be invested and involved for their benefit. But notice the warning that God gave them. He says to Samuel, do what they ask, but warn them about the way a king will reign over them. Warn them about the way in which a king will reign over them. This is a warning. We see when you get a king, you not only get someone who acts as a judge, but you get someone who assumes control. And as your pastor this morning, I want to say to you, be very careful over the things, the people, the products, the position, the power that you allow to control you. Leadership will always lead you somewhere. In this story, we see that they come across Saul. And Saul is appointed a king, not because he has a king's heart, but because he looks like a king. They got a king that looked like a king. But we see later in Saul's life, God rejects him because he doesn't think like the king or act like the king or have a heart like a king. And so God later appoints a young shepherd boy who was forgotten about in the field by his father, but yet, God remembered him. On Palm Sunday, is this is the day we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem as the triumphant king. He rides in as a king in victory. But the people in Israel and in Jerusalem in that day, they don't realize the victory that this king is going to bring comes to the cost of the cross. The people of Israel said, give us a king. We need someone who will give us leadership. We need someone who will judge us. And many years later, their answer walks in to Jerusalem. For a few moments, I want to look at how Jesus fulfills that role as king as who judges them. Remember I said a king who judges means he acts as a lawgiver. He rules with authority. He decides and divides. And he enters himself into situations. Well, we see that a king is to act as a lawgiver. And as you look at the study and, and look and, and, and review the life of Jesus Christ and his ministry, you see that Jesus said in one part, I did not come to abolish the law that God had set up. I am the fulfillment of that law. But encountering this king creates a change. So then he says later, in John 13 and 34, he says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. I'm giving you a new law. Love each other. Turn to the person next to you and say, I love you. You might have just met your wife. Just... As I have loved you, Jesus says, you should love each other. One of the greatest ways the enemy of the church will divide and destroy a church is by making the people forget that they're called to love one another. You see, love puts the other before itself. Love is willing to walk that extra mile. Love is willing to carry all those gifts to the big old Atlanta airport on your back. Love is willing to get up early in the morning and stay up late at night. Oh, they say somewhere love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. It does not envy. It does not boast. Jesus says, you know what, if, if, there, if there's going to be one law that is going to rule what I reign in, 
It's the law of love. You see, true love, honest love, genuine love is not hidden. It speaks the truth. It shares the truth. It shapes, it molds, it's gracious, it's kind, it's long-suffering. Christ is the king because he acts as a lawgiver. He gives us this law. He says elsewhere, they will know that you are my disciples. By what? If you have love for one another. Do people know you're a Christian because you tell them or because you show them? Do people know that you're part of the church of God because you are saying, I go to Calvary every Sunday? Or is it because you have genuine love for one another? He's a king because he's a lawgiver. He's also a king because he's come to rule and govern with authority. I don't want you to miss this point of the fact that Jesus has authority. There's a story in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a striking story. It's written also in Mark and Luke. It says an officer came to Jesus and said, Can you come heal my servant? A soldier, an officer. He said, Can you come and heal my servant? And Jesus said, Okay. And the man said, Well, listen, you can't come to my house. You can't, I'm unworthy. But if you will say the word, it says, Dear Lord, I am unworthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. And you know what Jesus said in response to that? He marveled, the word says, at the fact that no one else in Israel had recognized his authority. That when Jesus speaks the word, it gets done. Some of you folks are saying, I got to get to church on Sunday to pray for this. I got to do this to get this done. Oh, my family will be restored if I just do this, this, and this, and this, and send so much into the miracle spring water and get this prayer cloth. and all. No, no, no. Jesus only has to speak the word. He has authority over every situation. That's why as a child of God, you can say, Lord, I'm in need. You see what's happening in my life. You see how I'm struggling. Lord, I pray that you would speak peace to me. You would open doors for me. You would shut doors behind me. Just speak the word. That's his authority over us today. No one else I know. No one else I know can speak and get things done except for moms. Moms kind of have that ability, don't they? Speak the word, it gets done. Dad can speak it all day long. Clean up your toys. Clean up your toys. Clean up the toys, right? Come on, clean up the toys. In one ear, at the other. Mom comes down. And she'll say, now what did I tell you earlier today? And Levi's, Lydia's cleaned up the toys. There's authority. Let me remind you today that Jesus Christ has authority. Let me remind you he has the ability to govern over your life today. The king also has the ability to decide and divide. We see this in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus brings every person to a decision point. It's incredible. The ministry and the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is so prevalent. But he brings them all to a deciding point. There's a division that's going to take place. And one of these examples is this in Luke chapter 16. Where someone comes to Jesus and, and says, well, you know, what about... What about wealth? And what about, what about prosperity? And, and what about this? And, and he says, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. And he says this, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. He makes that divide very serious. He makes it a point of decision. Who are you going to serve? Who is going to be your king? See, there's leadership everywhere. There's leadership in people. 
leadership in products, leadership in things, leaderships in others. And God says through Jesus Christ, there comes a point of division. If you're really going to go along with this, you need to understand you can't serve two masters. It's impossible. It's like trying to take a person, two people on the same date. Don't work. It always fools up in the movies. You watch the movies. It never works out. No, I've never been lucky enough to get two dates in one night, so I don't know what that's like personally. But through the movies, it never works. A king comes to divide. Let me say this about you. Jesus is very serious about his kingdom. He is. He's very serious about his kingdom. He wants you to be part of it. He wants you to participate in it. He wants you to flourish because the word of God says that God had put giftings and talents into you to be used for the glory of God and his kingdom. There's something that only you can do, but Jesus is serious about this kingdom. He said to Pilate in the judgment hall, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. There is a division, a difference in his kingdom. So we have a king who acts as a lawgiver, a king who does rule and authority, a king who divides and decides. But this is my favorite part, and I feel like shouting here, my voice wasn't so bad. A king is a person who enters into controversy, who inserts himself into a situation. I could come across countless stories, but let me read you just one from the Gospel of Luke, how Jesus, our king, comes in and does what no one else can do. It says in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 15, it says, Soon after, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, now, that's not northern Labrador, okay? The community in northern Labrador is named after this place. And a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he was approaching the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son. This is desperate, okay? There is no welfare or social services at this time. If you're a widow, you depend on your kid. And if your kid dies and you're a widow, you are just as well dead as well. There's nothing for You're going to be begging the rest of your life. He dies. So the large crowd from the village was with there, and they were going out to the cemetery. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. He walked, then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. The people carrying it stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. That's what I said to Levi every morning. Young man, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. Oh, he must be Levi. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus gave him back to his mother. A king is one who inserts himself into a situation to change it. No one else can change it but the king. He's the only one who can change the situation. So listen to what he did. He saw the need. He felt compassion. He spoke into the mess. He walked towards, not from. I could just say praise God on that point alone. That in our mess and in our problems, in our pain, in our hurt, in our misunderstanding, in our times of disbelief, Jesus Christ does not run away from us, but he runs to us. He never had to go to that procession that day. He could have walked on by and went and did what he wanted to do. But he was struck by this situation. And he walked to them. It never says the disciples walked. It never says anybody else walked. Jesus walked to them. He touched the untouchable, and he gave the miracle that was needed. He was the only one that could do what needed to be done. A king is the only one who can enter into controversy and change the outcome. So for us today in this church, we're not like the Israelites who say, give us a king. We're going to say, not give us a king, give us the king. We want the one 
who has given a new law to love one another. We want the one who has authority and only has to speak the word. We want the one that calls us to dedicate our focus and life to him. We want the one that can step into any situation in a hospital room, in a marriage, in a family, in a job place. We want the one that can step into a rehab center, to step in to a rehabilitation after a stroke. We want the one that can go into that cancer ward. We want the one that can guide the surgeon's hand this morning. We want the king who can make the difference. I don't care. I, well, I do care who the prime minister is, but I don't care who it's going to be. Who the premier is, that's fine. Who the mayor is, that's okay. Who the counselors are, that's okay. It's even okay to me who's on the church board. All I'm concerned about is who's the king. Who's the one that got the last say? And I don't care. Times will come and go. Generations will come and go. People will change. But the king will stay the same forever. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, the people all around him are shouting, Hosanna! Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. See, the people in Jerusalem that day, they were shouting, Hosanna, Jesus is coming as king. They're thinking about the here and now. He's going to kick the Romans out. We're going to build the walls back up. We are going, he's making Jerusalem great again. And Jesus looked at them and said, you need more than an earthly kingdom. You need more than a change in your local government. You need a change in your heart. You know what? If we only depend on earthly leaders, we'll be always earthly disappointed. I will disappoint you at times if I haven't already. But let me say to you today, don't forget at Easter what you heard at Christmas. Don't forget now at Easter what you heard at Christmas, which is this. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. Get this. Oh, this makes me excited. His kingdom will never end. Don't forget now at Easter what we learned at Christmas. There is a kingdom that shall never end with a king who will never be disposed, a king who will never be overthrown, a king who reigns high and mighty, a king who is good and gracious, a king who can make the difference for you. And that's King Jesus. And on this Palm Sunday, we remember... And we celebrate that there is but one king. Many princes of this world, many politicians, presidents, prime ministers. When I was down in Atlanta, I took advantage of a morning and went to the presidential library of Jimmy Carter. He was from Georgia, and they have a huge presidential library. Very interesting. I found, of course, Jimmy Carter before my day, but I always found Jimmy Carter to be a very interesting person. He never did everything right. He never did everything wrong. That is a, what's going to be said about you, too, by the way. <laughs> but I was struck by several things about his presidency. There were times in his presidency when he could have taken advantage, and he didn't. And in this museum, they have, and I should have included a picture a replica of his Oval Office as it was. I was in the Oval Office, actually. And there was artwork from all over the world, the you know, pristine carpets. It was the same size. It was the perfect replica of the Oval Office. And sitting there on the president's desk was a little black book. And it said Bible. And on his desk next to him every day, he held a Bible to be inspired for that day. And he said this, and I thought it was so amazing, as, as, as you're going through the museum, you saw different quotes by him. 
He said, my Christian character shaped the way in which I tried to live my life. He was the president, the most powerful man at the time in the world. He brought about deals and positions and, and, and he, he created a whole different division of the government. The United States president is considered one of the most powerful people in the world. But that president knew there was a king. A kingdom greater than what even he had. Let me say this to you as I get ready to finish my introduction. <laughs> there is a king that deserves a ruling and reigning spot in your life. I came across a story this week that there was a preacher in Scandinavia who in his office one Sunday morning heard that the king of Scandinavia would be present in his church for worship. Understandably rattled, he decided to put aside his well-prepared sermon and spoke on, the, spoke on and spoke about the Christian virtues of the king. Even though the king said nothing after the service, the preacher could not help but wonder if he would receive some sort of award, some sort of prize for speaking so well about the king and his presence in that public worship service. Sure enough, some time later, a very large box was delivered to the church. Immediately, the priest said, this must be my reward for being so loyal to the king. He pried open the box and found inside a life-size crucifix. The crucifix is Jesus on the cross, right? He could hardly contain his disappointment. We've already got lots of crucifixes, he said. As he looked inside the crate, he saw a letter that was sealed with the royal seal. He opened it excitedly, thinking, okay, this is my reward. And the letter contained the king's instructions. It said this, fix this crucifix on the back wall of the church, directly in front of the pulpit, so that the preacher will always be reminded of which king he should speak about. It's not my kingdom. It's not your kingdom. It's not what's happening in the world today. Our message, our motto, our method is all wrapped up in the fact that we proclaim Jesus Christ as our king. He's the king of our hearts, the king of our family, the guiding post that we follow. He is the one. And so like those of Israel... We don't say give us a king. Anybody will do. We don't want a Saul. We don't even want a David. We say today give us the king. The king of the world. The one who can make the difference. So today you may be living your life in the influence of King Charles III. God help you. You might be living your life in the influence of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Uh-huh. Okay. You might be living your life on the influence of king-sized chocolate bars. And to that, I'll say hallelujah. But hear me clearly. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up again. And we're going to sing that chorus, uh, Good and Gracious King. Live your life today under the power and influence of King Jesus. As he came into Jerusalem that day, they were waving palm branches. Waving palm branches, and John says they put their coats on the ground. He rode on an animal that had never been rode before. And as he came into Jerusalem, they were shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a triumphant entry. It's an exciting entry. But these people wanted a king on the throne, but needed a king in their heart. The kingship of Jesus requires us to say that he is the be all, end all. The kingship of Jesus requires us not to treat him just as something we honor on Sundays, but something that's exemplified in our life.
throughout the week. This morning, as we prepare to finish up our service, I want to do something this morning I think is very important. I mentioned in my sermon that a king enters into controversy. When they said, give us a king to judge us, they said, give us a king who can step in and make things right. Give us a king who's not afraid of the problems, not afraid of the setbacks. Give us a king that can step into a situation and make it right. Today, I know many people here are dealing with situations beyond their ability. Maybe there's situations in your body, situations in your family. There's something going on this morning that God needs to minister to. You need a king who will step in, see, speak, feel, touch, do. You need a king today who's not walking away, but walking to. You need a king today who's willing to touch the untouchable thing and change the situation. You need a king willing today to speak into what's happening in your life and to say to some things in your life, get up. To some other things he has to say, get out. You need a king today. And as we sing this song, I'm going to invite you to stand. And if this morning you have a need in your life, that you see, I need the King Jesus to come in and minister to. Do something for me, something in my body, something in my family, something in my life today. I want you to come to this altar space. And friend, if you see someone come, don't let them stand alone. And as you come today, we'll pray with you. Because to say that Jesus is King is not just a nice thing to say, something we preach on Palm Sunday. But to say that Jesus is King is to say that Jesus has authority over what's happening right now. And he can make the crooked places straight. He can open closed doors. He can restore what the enemy has taken. He can bring back what's been taken away from me. He can do what no one else can do. The peasant, the preacher, the bishop, not even the teacher can do what the king can do. And today we serve one king, one king only. Would you stand with me as we go across this place today? We're going to sing this chorus, You Deserve the Greater Glory. If that's you this morning, would you come to this altar time? We want to pray with you before this service is finished. Let's sing this together. You deserve the greater glory. You deserve the greater glory. 